Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to worship at First Presbyterian Church of Logan. We're so glad that you came together on this nice and cool day. Isn't that glorious? Either in person, on Facebook Live, or later on YouTube. I need to take a matter of privilege this morning, and we have something that we need to celebrate. We always need to celebrate on Sunday, but we have something in addition to giving thanksgiving and praise to God, and that is to give thanksgiving and praise to God for the gift of relationship, and in particular, marriage. Harriet and Willis have been married 64 short years. And so I think we should sing happy anniversary to them. And Susan's going to help us play that. Good times and bad times, through plenty and want, Harriet and Willis have been faithful and loving to each other and to their kids and their family and to their church family and their faith community. They are such a model of who we are called to be as disciples of Christ. With that joy in our heart, let us worship God.
stand and join me in the call to worship. For the warmth of the sun, the beauty of the world, we bring our praise to you, creating God. For the inspiration of worship, we bring our praise to you, holy God. For the joy of fellowship, the support of friends, church. Let us worship God. join me in the prayer of confession. Almighty God, we confess that we have shaped our own standards and values rather than seeking to know your will. We turn from faith in you and rebel against the agenda of your realm. Our hopes focus on the beliefs we can accumulate more than on your mission in which we can share. Lead us, O oh God, into the acts of compassion, that our attitudes may be reshaped and a right relationship with you restored. Amen. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, and peace given to us through God's grace. Live in the word of the Lord and be made new to serve the Lord and may you always be known by your love. Thanks be to God, in Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Let us share the signs of the peace of Christ with one another.
join me in the prayer of illumination. Holy God, your word is like fire. By the power of your spirit, illumine our sight and inflame our hearts that we may live lives more faithful to your will. Amen. You may be seated. Reading God's word, we will start with Psalm 80 from the Contemporary English Version. Shepherd of Israel, you lead the descendants of Joseph, and you sit on their, your throne above the winged creatures. Listen to our prayer and let your light shine for the tribes of Ephraim, Benjamin, and Manasseh. Save us by your power. We were like a grapevine you brought out of Egypt. You chased other nations away and planted us here. Then you cleared the ground and we put our roots deep, spreading over the land. Shade from this vine covered the mountains. Its branches climbed the mighty cedars and stretched to the sea. Its new growth reached to the river. Our Lord, why have you torn down the wall from around the vineyard? You let everyone who walks by pick the grapes. Now the vine is gobbled up by pigs from the forest and other animals. God, all-powerful, please do something. Look down from heaven and see what's happening to this vine. With your own hands, you planted its roots and you raised it as your very own. Enemies chopped the vine down and set it on fire. Now show your anger and destroy them, but help the one who sits at your right side, the one who raised to be your very own. Then we will never turn away, but new life into us, and we will worship you Lord God, all-powerful, make us strong again. Smile on us and save us. The next reading is from Luke 12, the contemporary English version. I came to set fire to the earth, and I wish it were already on fire. I'm going to be put to a hard test, and I will have to suffer a lot of pain until it is over. Do you think that I came to bring peace to earth? No, indeed. I came to make people choose sides. A family of five will be divided, with two of them against the other three. Fathers and sons will turn against one another, and mothers and daughters will do the same. Mothers-in-law and daughters-in-law will also turn against each other. Jesus said to the people, as you, soon as you see a cloud coming up in the west, you say, it's going to rain, and it does. When the south wind blows, you say, it's going to get hot, and it does. Are you trying to fool someone? You can predict the weather by looking at the earth and the sky, but you don't really know what's going on right now. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. If you've ever glanced at the evening news, or skim the newspaper, or listen to podcasts, or surf the internet, or check your Facebook feed, it's indisputable that as a society, I think we're pretty messed up. <laughs> Pandemic, inflation, gun violence, and global warming aside, most of us can't even manage to return our shopping carts back to the designated space in the parking lot. 
But is it really our fault? I read a post that actually helped me to understand my own weirdness. And the post took a look back at what they currently term incredibly irresponsible, incredibly irresponsible cartoons. Some of us were fed as impressionable young children and it revealed, no, it's not my fault, I'm weird. It can't be, it's all those cartoons I watched. So I'm gonna pick two of them, Tom and Jerry, Tom and Jerry. Ah, oh, who doesn't love Tom and Jerry? Take a second and dig into the murky recesses of your early memories and really think about Tom and Jerry. It was cute, right? It was cute. Uh, no, it was the godfather of television violence. Give it a quick rewatch in the searing light of the 21st century and see what you think. Now I'm gonna give you a few examples to jog your memory. Jerry stuffing a lit stick of dynamite into Tom's mouth where it explodes. Tom shooting himself in the head with a shotgun. Jerry slamming a red hot waffle iron shut on Tom's tail. The sheer inventiveness of the methods of torture and mayhem rivals all the criminal mind episodes you could possibly binge. Really, it's a wonder we're all as well adjusted as we are. And the second one, Popeye the Sailor. Yes. Now, to be fair, it's tough to talk badly about Popeye. He's a good problem solver, and his affinity with spinach is theoretically admirable, although his dependence on the substance does give us pause. But his rampant ignorance, coupled with a tendency toward hatred and violence, simply cannot be ignored. He claims to be, and I quote, one tough gazookas, which hates all palookas, what ain't on the up and square. How intolerant is that? And the next verse, in which Popeye says, and I quote, he biffs them and buffs them and always out roughs them. It's equally, if not more, troubling. We'd say the old adage, use your words, not your fists, should be employed, but considering the poor guy's grasp of the English language, we have to believe he's doing the best he can regardless. He's not a great role model. Now, I don't know about you, but I used to spend hours in front of the TV on Saturday morning and after school with these cartoon characters, plus Captain Kangaroo, Icky Twerp, Slang Bang Theater, The Three Stooges, there wasn't enough time to talk about The Three Stooges, and all of the beloved characters from Looney Tunes and Merry Melodies. Never once, Never once did it occur to me that there was too much violence and too little role modeling. Now I look back with nostalgia at the brightly redigitized and restored classic cartoons and still enjoy them, remembering my youth. But I take pause and I wonder, why didn't I see the other side of those cartoons? Hmm. Today's text shows us another side of Jesus. In the spring, when I was preparing my outline for sermons through Labor Day, I didn't circle or mark the gospel for August the 14th for today. I didn't like what I was reading in the lectionary text. I left it blank and frankly didn't choose the reading for today until last week. Well, why? Well, just look at it. In the reading from Luke, we confront stark and conflicting sayings of Jesus that sit poorly with the contemporary images of God. 
Our culture seems to prize a God with an infinite capacity for empathy, a God who is nice. Bumper stickers tell you that Jesus loves you, even if everyone else thinks you're an ogre or worse. But Luke challenges this thinking, shows us another side. He offers a glimpse of redemption for a world that is anything but nice and that needs much more than a nice God to redeem it. Well, that's kind of difficult to preach on Sunday morning. When the American writer Will Durant tried to identify the historically authentic Jesus, he used what he called a criterion of embarrassment. A criterion of embarrassment. Simply put, it's hard to see why writers would fabricate embarrassing material that hurts their cause. We tend to hide embarrassing stories. We don't publish them for posterity. Durant gave examples like Peter's denial and the flight of the disciples when Jesus was arrested. Well, I would include this week's gospel as another embarrassing example of the authentic Jesus. I have come to bring fire on the earth and how I wish it were already kindled, Jesus says. But I have a baptism to undergo and what constraint I am under until it is completed. Do you think I came to bring peace on earth? Isn't that what we do at Christmas? Peace on earth, goodwill toward all? No, Jesus says, I tell you I've come to bring division from now on. And he talks about the five member family and how there will be discord and conflict and division and how one will be pitted against the other. One biblical scholar reminds us, these are harsh words, but hardly an exception. Remember when Jesus was presented and Simeon professed that Jesus would be a sign of contradiction. Contradiction. Jesus was rejected by his hometown of Nazareth. His family tried to apprehend him as insane. His brothers didn't believe in him. The people of Capernaum ran him out of town. A Samaritan village wouldn't even let him enter their town. His detractors said he was demon-possessed and raving mad. And the religious elite opposed him fiercely. Many of his disciples quit following him. And Rome executed him because people said that he told them not to pay their taxes. So much for our safe and soft, cuddly version of Jesus. That's the version we want right there, the Good Shepherd. That's the one we want. And this harsh opposition to a divisive Jesus reverberates throughout the entire New Testament. Let me give you some example. Peter describes Jesus as the stone of stumbling and the rock of offense. Paul called him a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. And John, Jesus prays for his followers. I have given them your word and the world has hated them. For they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. And the epistle of Hebrews confirms that prayer. And the cry of the psalmist this week summarizes the message of that epistle lesson. You have made us an object of derision to our neighbors and our enemies mock us. Contradicting the angel's promise of peace on earth at his birth, Jesus emphatically denies that he's come to bring peace. Instead, he claims to be the bearer of discord and fragmentation. 
I came to bring fire to the earth. And he also said, do you think that I have come to bring peace to the earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. And he illustrates his claim by defying traditional systems of meaning and cohesion, especially familiar and intergenerational ties. And this is within a context, a cultural context, in which kinship, relationship, familiar ties defined your life. How can this be good news? How can this be good news? I think the answer depends on how we see the world we live in with his systems of meaning and cohesion. If our world were nothing but a place of created goodness and profound beauty, a space of flourishing for all, a place of justice and life-giving for all in God's creation, then Jesus' challenge would be deeply troubling. But if, on the other hand, our world is deeply marred and scarred and death dealing for many life forms with systems of meaning that are exploitative and non-sustainable, then redemption can come only when those systems are shattered and consumed by fire. Life cannot re-emerge without confrontation. This is the basis of the conflict Jesus envisions. He comes not to disturb a nice world, but to shatter the disturbing and death-dealing systems of meaning that stifle life. Some think Jesus, in today's gospel reading, is talking about the end of the world. Some think he is speaking of the downfall of his own nation, Israel, which happened in 69, not too long after his death. And some think Jesus was speaking of his own death. But perhaps we look at his words with too small or narrow a focus. Perhaps we need to acknowledge the ways in which division, which is painful, causes hurt, and brings sorrow, has midwife the birth of God's justice into the world. Someone who came to understand this was Dietrich Bonhoeffer. As he struggled to live through the challenges of his own life faithfully, Bonhoeffer wrote from his prison cell in 1944 that he saw his life split into fragments like a bomb falling on houses. The violence of an inhuman war that he witnessed had shattered any sense of wholeness in his life. Yet out of this painful experience, he had profound insight and vision. This very fragmentariness may, says Bonhoeffer, in fact point toward a fulfillment beyond the limits of human achievement. And as the world around him descended further into chaos, Bonhoeffer wrote, the important thing today is that we should be able to discern from the fragment of our life how the whole was arranged and planned and what material it consists of. For really, there are some fragments that are only worth throwing into the dustbin, and others whose importance lasts for centuries, because their completion can only be a matter for God, and so there are fragments that must be fragments. In the end, Bonhoeffer's own life became a fragment, abruptly broken off, yet pointing to wholeness. As Bonhoeffer had understood in his prison cell, if brokenness and crisis were to become the edge 
where change is possible. This crisis would have to be sustained by something stronger than the human. In a world whose systems of meaning do not bring life and flourishing, the crisis brought by the fire of the burning bush might just constitute good news. This gospel lesson calls us to witness to this good news and to the crisis that God's consuming presence is extinguishing. Life cannot flourish without crisis. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us stand and affirm our faith using an excerpt from a brief statement of faith. Let us affirm what we believe. We trust in God, the Holy Spirit, everywhere, the giver and renewer of life. The Spirit justifies us by grace through faith and sets us free to accept ourselves and to love God and neighbor. The same Spirit who inspired the prophets and apostles rules our faith and life in Christ through Scripture, engages us through the word proclaimed, claims us in the waters of baptism, feeds us with the bread of life and the cup of salvation, and calls women and men to all ministries of the church. Amen. Please be seated. Let us pray. God of mercy, throughout the ages you have led us through trial and hardship, providing all our needs and speaking words of promise. Confident of your faithfulness, we bring to you our prayers for the world. We pray for the mission of your church, that it may plant and grow faithful people to serve others in love. We pray for the world, that all might tend to your justice and watch for your coming reign. We pray for all who suffer, that our care for them may reveal your healing. We pray for your creation, that we may cultivate its flourishing. We remember before you those who have died and pray for those who will die today, that they may rest in light divine. Through Christ, with Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, Almighty Father. This we pray in the glorious name of your Son, who taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Faith in action. How do we do that? How do we do that? Well, you can look at your calendar in your order of worship, many ways that you can put your faith in action. 
Uh, this Thursday, we will have the community meal. Our brothers and sisters from St. Paul's Episcopal, Episcopal Church, that's hard to say, Episcopal Church, will be hosting the meal, but we can always use volunteers, and we will, our food pantry will also be open as well. Just a little bit about our food pantry. Um, on average, since we reconstituted the food pantry, uh, more than 10 families have been served each time, and we have served uh, about 115 individuals. That's amazing. That is absolutely amazing. Thanks be to God. Um, want to remind you that the t-shirts are still on sale. And look what we have. We have bags and they're very big and it's another fundraiser for our beautification project in our food pantry and they are uh, we'd like a donation of at least three dollars if you want to give more we'll certainly take it uh, but we we encourage at least a three dollar donation for the bag and it would be your bag and I would encourage you to put your name on it so we don't get confused but those, I'll, I'll be um, in Fellowship Hall, Westminster House, after worship uh, for coffee hour. And if you'd like to purchase one or if you don't have funds today, that's okay. We trust you. You can take a bag and get it to us later. I also want to ask that you keep uh, your nominating committee uh, in your prayers. The nominating committee is uh, beginning to work on the slate for elders and deacons for 2025. <clears throat> and they are also working on the slate for the PNC, the pastor nominating committee. So your prayers for their wisdom and their discernment would be greatly appreciated. Our God, who is faithful, blesses us with abundance of gifts. So in gratitude, let us offer all that we have and all that we are for the love of Christ, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith.
Let us pray. God of the ages, surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, we faithfully add our gifts to those who have gone before us throughout the generations. Bless these gifts that they may yield an increase for the spreading of your love in your world. Amen. that hymn. I love that hymn. I mean, I can't help but move. Y'all were just standing there. Come on, let's move. We're Presbyterians. We can kind of get our arms maybe here. I don't know. I don't think we can get them any higher. There you go. So Susan, would you, would you do a favor for me? Let's do stanza four. Verse four for our benediction. And a little faster, and let's make it a toe tapper. And you better move. Y'all better move. Feel that Holy Spirit standing on the promises. Let's do it. Okay.
And all God's people said, Amen. 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 That's a real toe tapper. I like that song a lot. And you know, it wasn't in the blue hymnal. Yeah, it was in the red hymnal way back when. They took it out and they put it back in in the new hymnal. So thanks be to God. So don't forget about coffee hour, nibbles and noshes, nominating committee meets. A community meal and food pantry this week and lots of opportunities to put your faith in action. And as you depart in the fellowship of God the Father Almighty, remember, by the goodness of God you were born into this world. By the grace of God you've been kept all the day long, even until this very moment, so you could sing standing on the promises. And by the love of God, fully revealed in the face of Jesus Christ, you are being redeemed. And may the blessing of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you this day and every day. Amen. Amen.